right, today we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We left off uh, sort of two-thirds of the, of the way through ch uh, chapter 1, verse 2 of the prophet Nahum. And uh, as a backdrop to the prophet, I want to start off by reading Psalm 103. It's a, I think this is a... I, I probably, with the Psalms, I could have done this, open the Psalms and boom, put my finger on several of the Psalms to, uh, uh, to look at both the justice, uh, the judgment, and the mercy of God all wrapped together. And this is the picture we have with Nahum. Is, uh, he's, he's foretelling uh, something that would happen like 50 years after his, after his prophecy of the fall of Nineveh. But Psalm 103, as I said, as the background of that, shows the, the greatness of the Lord. That's what the verses 2 through 8 in Nahum also, also talk about, is this severity, this greatness of the Lord, that He is the one that, that can bring judgment because He is God. We looked at Him being a jealous God, jealous for uh, His people and not, not going a whoring after other gods as they did. And, and likewise, even more so, as we see the case of Nineveh, they had a reprieve. The Assyrian Empire had a reprieve, but what did they do? They went back to their old wicked ways. They went back to the idolatry that, that they were in, which was, was God's reason for sending Jonah. And they repented then, but they went right back. Such is the history of the nation of Israel as well. So let's go to Psalm 103. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. That sounds like a worship song, doesn't it? <laughs> but let's start again. Let's read through. Uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who, who satisfieth by, uh, thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways with Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel, the Lord's merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. No, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his, is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know I no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his, com uh, uh, his covenant, and to those who remember his commands to do them, the Lord hath prepared his throne in heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his, his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And may the Lord add his blessing to his word this morning. So we're going to be looking at the patience and long-suffering of God. I'm not going to try to go through all of Psalm 103, but I think it sounds pretty self-explanatory. Bless the Lord. He's the one that's in control of all things. With the nation of Israel, he overlooked their sins and still 
His promises to them are still true today. All that's all that he's promised, he will keep to Abraham and to David. The more sure mercies of David, he will keep. But we ended last week in Nahum uh, chapter 1 and verse number 2. And while it's hot, I, I think this is appropriate here. We, uh, we looked at last week, we had our introduction of, of who Nahum was, uh, where he was from, from Elkosh, and his ministry uh, was during the days uh, while, while Judah was still there, the, the Is Israelites, the northern ten kingdoms, were, were in captivity at this time. And, and, then, and uh, Nahum quite possibly was part of that, part of that captivity. And, and he was in Elkosh, which, is, which uh, some would say would be near the, the city of Nineveh. You know, there's others that say he was, it was an unknown city in Judah. But I, I have no problem with either way. It can, it can go either way. But he was there, and, and he has this poetic prophecy to Nineveh about their downfall, but in, interspersed throughout all, all of it, and as with all of the prophets, the minor ones as well as the major prophets, is the grace of God is, is through it all, the grace and mercy of, of God. So we looked at uh, the fact that the Lord is the one that revengeth, He's furious. He's he's what gets God's goat? Is that can, can something get God's goat? Where did that phrase ever come come from? Yeah, that really gets my goat. Uh, what get what gets God's goat and causes His jealousy is when His people worship other gods. It would be like a, a husband and a wife, and and the husband uh, would be jealous if he found his wife with another woman. He'd be jealous. Be furious, even in most cases, and vice versa, as well. So God is is furious. He He's the one that will take vengeance upon those nations, and upon upon His own nation by using those other nations that that He judges as well. So He re revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. That's where we left it off in, in Romans chapter 16. We saw that indeed vengeance does belong to God. Today, we are not to avenge wrath upon anybody. We leave that up to God. And the example of, in, in there in Romans 16, of, of throwing heaps of burning coals upon your adversary's head and, and what that'll do to a person. Uh, they don't know what to do with it. That's the problem. It says, why am I being treated so nicely by this person that I hate and probably hates me as well? But our position is a position of grace in all things. Uh, a position, our, our speech, to be seasoned with salt. Our, our kindness should be shown to the world around us. After all, we're the only ones that, that some people will actually see that, that can demonstrate the grace of God. But we look at, at, at the end of, of chapter 2, uh, I mean verse number 2, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. You know, the wrath of God is not going to be upon us. The wrath of God, he's, he's, he's delivered us from the wrath to come in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, we have no wrath. That's why we believe in the in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, he will take his body out of this world and then, then he'll execute that wrath upon, upon the rejecting world and, his, and the people who re the people of uh, the nation of Israel as well that reject him. But it's interesting while we look at this word wrath, it's in, if you have a King James Bible, it's, it, wrath is in italics, but the whole, the whole notion uh, is is about reserveth wrath for his enemies. The whole, that's a whole package. The wrath for his enemies, not for his friends. He will protect the elect through the tribulation period as well. 
But wrath, it's an interesting word. I just happened to look it up in, in the scriptures. It's, uh, the word wrath itself is found 197 times in scripture. I think I may have told you about uh, this, this one gentleman that we had. He was coming every Wednesday night trying to say that God wasn't a God of wrath. And uh, <laughs> I can remember Gordon. I think Gordon scared the daylights out of him when, when, when Gordon walked over and he went, went like this. He went like that. That guy almost ran out the door that night. <laughs> remember that, Gordo? <laughs> uh, but I, I, I brought his, he was an advocate of, uh, uh, of the Lamza Bible. Now, uh, George Lamza, the, the translator of the, the Lamza Bible, he was a, he was a Nestorian. He believed that, 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 that Jesus and God were, were, were separate, but they, they were glued together, sort of like particle board. They were, they were one, instead of being a, a distinct person of the Trinity. That's, that's the easy way to describe ne Nestorianism, one of the, the heresies of, of the early church, but yet there are still proponents of it today, including George Lobson. So, and I think I might have that Bible back there someplace and it's still got the, the notes. I took just in the New Testament, all of the, the places where it has wrath in it, uh, the word wrath, and, uh, and he was trying to tell me that God, there's no such thing as wrath. God, God will deliver everybody, uh, universal salvation for everyone. And uh, I simply turned them around to the Lamza Bible that, that he gave to somebody else that they gave to me and uh and with all those those note markings in there the what do you call the things the, the the sticky the sticky notes of where where wrath was in the bible you know i pointed to him and he was happy that i had a lamp lamza bible but i said all those notes all those sticky notes talk about the wrath of god because the wrath of god is true he executes vengeance he executes wrath upon upon those who don't believe He's done that from the beginning to the end in the wilderness. Even the Israelites, uh, even the Israelites fell under his, his wrath and his judgment. How many times can we remember where there was 20,000 that God killed because they didn't believe, etc. But this wrath of uh, uh, 197 times in Scripture, and, and the word in Hebrew, when you see it in Hebrew, it's the word af which literally means nostril, nose, or face. So his wrath. Did you ever, did you ever see a bull on a, on a movie? They always show him with a ring in his nose, and he's going, <laughs> he's snorting. This bull has some wrath to that guy with the red cape. Even though he's colorblind, he knows it's a red cape. I don't know how, but, but he's wrath. He's... he's, he's he has the wrath. He knows nothing but to go after that, that, that person in the ring. I, I saw a movie where they uh, just recently saw a movie where it was a spy movie where they came up in the middle of the a bull ring. They were underneath the ground in, in Rome and they came up and one of the bad guys ended up coming up through a, it was a top secret uh, tunnel that was under there and he ended up coming up right in the middle of the bull ring. What happened to him? He got run right over. But, uh, but it, it was interesting that because I was thinking about that already and then saw that. Uh, so, so God's wrath, it's like his nostril and no, his, or nose or face, or face is the word for wrath. Have you ever gotten hot under the collar? It's, that's the Greek word actually uh, uh, for wrath. It's, it's, it's basically heated, hot under the collar, aggravated. And, uh, and, and you... Your, your, your nose flare, flares out and your throat flares out, you turn red. That's the exact word it means. That's what it means, the wrath of God. He's like that. Though we can't see his face or anything, what a picture it is. He's so, so angry with sin of his people that he actually, actually has those same attributes of, of wrath. And uh, the Greek word for, for wrath by and large, is it's an excitement of the mind. You know, somebody pulls you up, pulls over, pulls in front of you. For a moment, you get wrathful. You get excited. I'm going to get you. You know, but God has every right 
to pour his wrath upon an unbelieving world, an unbelieving people. Uh, during the summer, though, when I, when I was working, uh, we'd have hot days like these. It never bothered me in the summer. People would say, say to me, how can you handle being out in the heat? I said, well, I just think about the heat that I'm not gonna withstand in hell. This place is pretty cool. Think of it that way. That'll cool you right down, right there. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and so, uh, so, so the wrath, the implication of, of the, the Greek word for wrath is, is punishment. Uh, indignation from God. And he, can, and he, is, he, is, he is God. He has every right. I had a, one of my son-in-laws asked me a question. We were, well, not asked me a question. He was talking about the most difficult question that man has is how can God, uh, how can God allow suffering on this earth? And I said to him, I, I said to him, I said, that's not a difficult question. I think philosophically and scriptural, it's an easy question. People don't like the answers, but it's, it's a pretty simple question. God has every right uh, to, to allow suffering. God doesn't create the suffering. He allows the suffering. Why? Because of the sin that's in the world. We're in a fallen world. We're still under the Adamic curse. We're still cursed with these bodies. And both young people and old people die. So that's why we can see the person that that's never smoked a, a pack of cigarettes in his entire life can have lung cancer at 30 years old and somebody that smoked four packs of cigarettes every day of his life can live to 103 or 107 or whatever age. It's because of, the, because of this fallen nature and this fallen world that we're in. So it's not God's fault. It's mankind's fault. That that they're that they're in sin, we're under the under the same bodies, cursed bodies as Adam and Eve brought upon us. So God is God is He's able to bring His wrath. Now it's a little different uh, word. We have wrath and we have the word wrath. You ever hear that? We don't use it today. God was wrath. He was wrath. That. In Greek, that means to grow warm. Literally, I wrote down hot under the collar. Go warm with vengeance. We, we, we have all done that before. I know, don't say you never have. We've, we've all been hot with anger in the past, but God is this, the, the terminology for it. And, uh, and the Greek is, is to be exasperated or angry. Simple, more simple. I love the, the Hebrew. There's so many more nuances that I can't even, you can't even imagine how many different nuances there are in the, these Hebrew words and, and these, these plays on words. And then we see, without going to, to, to here, we see that, that the word kindled. Obviously, we know what the word kindled means. It literally means to set on fire, to burn. That's why we see throughout the scriptures, we see kindled and anger together. Anger was kindled, right? I, I won't do the word search right now for it, but we, we will see those things together so often. Anger is kindled. We already have anger as it is, but what takes something to spark it up, doesn't it? So that's the, that's the world. That's the world we're in, the fallen world, world we're in. God is perfectly just to to bring his anger and his wrath. And, and the fact that it's kindled even more so by the idolatry in the world. But yet, as we look along, we'll see that he is patient still. Otherwise, we'd all be consumed today. Thankfully for the mercy of God, great is thy faithfulness, right from the middle of Book of Lamentations, right in the middle of the judgments, you have lamentations right there, pleading, Jeremiah, should we go there? No, let's not, because I'm trying to finish by before 11.15, while it's still before it gets really hot today. But we know the song taken right from, from, uh, from Lamentations 3, 
He had to, Jeremiah had to have this realization. You know, look, I've been preaching, I've been teaching all this long, and I have to realize that your faithfulness is new every morning. That's, that's our position we ought to have as well today. But let's go down to uh, verse number three in Nahum chapter one. It took me longer to get out of chapter two than I thought, but. Verse number three says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his, of his feet. The simple, the simple matter is no matter what. When, when did we just see uh, the beginning of verse 3 quoted? It was Jonah. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. He, he quoted, he, he said this very same thing from Exodus chapter 34. He said this very same thing, but yet he still desired judgment to fall on Nineveh. He said, I, would, I was faithful. I know that you're a just God, and I know that, that you're faithful. Inside, he knew that, he was, that God was faithful and just enough that he could very well forgive or, or pass over the ju the ju his judgments upon the wicked city Nineveh. That's why he ran away. But here, it, it's quoted once again. Let's go. I already read all of Psalm 103, but, but verses 3 to 8 in Psalm 103 quote this very same thing let's go to joel chapter 2 the book of joel the book of joel chapter 2 and we'll carry we'll carry this out to to when God will have the final judgment during the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, Joel chapter 2, let's go down to, I, I know I'd love to go to, to verse number 1 through 11, but let's go to verse 12, just to get the gist of... Uh, Therefore, also now... And he's saying this during this is during this takes place during the tribulation period. This is the during the day of the Lord during the seventieth week when God is God is bringing His judgment upon upon His nation. Uh, Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart, not your garments, and then turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. If you'll turn to him, there's a chance, verse number 14, he's gonna turn, he's gonna turn and not bring judgment. I think, ver I think verse 14 took place in Acts chapter 2 while Peter was preaching on, on Joel chapter 2. He turned his anger away. At that point, he put, he put Israel on the back burner, which we find in, in Romans 9, 10, and 11. He put Israel on, on the back burner, put them on a shelf, some would say. I think the technical word was he brought them into, into abeyance. They, he cast them to aside, but not forever. He will, he will restore Israel back to their land completely. We find that in, in Ezekiel 39 is a great place where the united houses of Israel will come together and they'll be back in their land, be, uh, be brought back there. He will fulfill these things at the day of the Lord when Christ returns. So we, we, see, that, we see that here. And then, of course, Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, he, he quoted these verses as well. So he, he will. Remember, the, the issue here with the nation of Israel was to be patient. The Lord is going to have his way with his enemies. I think I was in the book of Habakkuk last week as well. Uh, Habakkuk, the questioning prophet, 
How come you haven't? How come you haven't kicked the butts of the enemies? That's basically what what Habakkuk was saying. And God told him to go. Write down what I tell you, because there will be a time when I am going to take care of those enemies. Write those things so that those who are able to read it can run, so they can they can they can know that this is my judgment that's coming. Remember, let all those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. You know, they, they'll they'll know those that listen, those that hear, heard the prophetic voices from the prophets themselves would have hope. But we know what happened. They didn't listen to the prophets. The people of God didn't listen to Moses. They didn't listen to the very words of God that Moses would bring down to them. Let's go to... Uh, let's go back to Nahum. Continue in verse number three. Uh, verse number three, the Lord, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Yes, judgment's coming. Judgment will be coming upon the world. The wicked will be judged. I think it's hot now. Wait until that judgment comes upon the world. Uh, Peter would talk about this as well, but we'll get to that in a couple moments. Look at the end of the verse. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. This simply shows the, the majesty of God. I, I have to look it up someplace. I wonder if somebody's tried to, tried to make a sermon out of, uh, of the clouds of the dust of his feet. Literally, God walks around with dust with clouds and <laughs> and that, but this is definitely, you can tell this is an allegory talking about the mercy, talking about the, the, the sovereignty of God. I know we'll all go out looking at the clouds today thinking, boy, this is a nice one that would fit, fit, the, fit the foot of God right there, but yet shows his immensity, his, his sovereignty of all things. He rebuketh the sea, verse number four, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. We have scripture we can go back to there. Didn't anybody remember the Red Sea? Remember the Red Sea crossing where, where Israel got out of, out of uh, was born in Egypt and Moses led them across the Red Sea? I, I have the scriptures written down to go there. Uh, yeah, let's go to Psalm 106. The, the, this is the shortcut in the Psalm. Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Verse number 9. Actually, let's hmm. Yeah, let's go. Let's go to verse number one through nine. Now praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all His praise? Blessed. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may, may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, P provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. 
Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And uh, we can go on. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words and sang his praise. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request but sent leanness unto their soul. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron he sent of the Lord. I lost my place. Verse 17, The earth opened and swallowed up uh, Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. I'm going to stop there, but we see the, the rebuking the Red Sea about his deliverance. And, and, and the psalm goes on to explain the, the, the many different ways that, that God delivered his people in spite of their rebellion. Uh, let's go over to uh, Joshua chapter 3. Not the whole chapter. Joshua chapter 3. I think we know this story as well. We had Moses crossing the Red Sea, and here we have Joshua crossing the Jordan River that God dried up. Joshua chapter 3, uh, in, in verse number... See, this is a short chapter, so I'm tempted to go with the whole thing. But just for, just for the keeping with the subject today, and it came to pass, in verse 14, and it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people... And as they, they that bear the ark were come into Jordan, and the feet of the priests that, were, that, that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks at the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose upon, upon a heap very far from the city, Adam, that is, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down, down toward the sea of the, uh, of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. So God did this incredible work in the Red Sea, drying up the sea, and in, it wasn't just a little tiny passageway in the Red Sea that, that was three, three inches deep, as the liberal scholars would say. It was in the depths of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Akbar and the Red Sea, where, the, where they crossed over, which is probably a thousand feet deep. And they've actually found, they've found the remains of, of, of Egyptian chariots down underneath there. So it wasn't this little area, you'll hear, you'll hear the liberal scholars say, yeah, it was, it was because God didn't stop the water. It was because there was a great wind and it dried up the water that was there so they could cross through the marsh. That's bovine scatology right there. <laughs> there was the depths of the Red Sea that God delivered them. They, they were, the, the, the Israelites were cursing God because they brought them to a place where there was no turning back. They had the deep water they couldn't cross and behind them were the Egyptians. Why are you leading us here? So they were in doubt. They didn't trust the Lord, but the Lord still caused that Red Sea, again, standing up, a wall of water, and they were able to cross through that dry area. And it's interesting, right where they crossed, there's a small area that's not as deep as the, the surrounding area around where they were able to cross. But yet, God did this marvelous work, and they, they rejected Him. Uh, they rejected Him in the wilderness. They reject Him today. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29. I love the prophecies of Moses. You say the prophet Moses? What do you mean by that? 
Jesus said that Moses said there'd be another prophet just like him. And, and there was. You know, so Moses being the prophet Moses in Deut Deuteronomy chapter 29, which sets up another one of my favorite chapters in Deuteronomy chapter 30. But Deuteronomy 29, I was laying in bed reading last night and I showed, I showed Helen these, these verses last night. She was trying to sleep and I kept her awake. Uh, verse number one. Oh, I'm in Deuteronomy 1. We can start there and get to 29. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. And Moses, verse number two, and Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before you, your eyes, in the land of Egypt unto, unto Pharaoh, and unto all his servants, and unto all his land. The great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles. It says you've seen it. You witnessed it. Yet the Lord hath not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness, your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy feet. So in verse number four, the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. You still don't understand even to this day. Why? It's not the fact that God didn't give, give it to them. God gave them their choice. Even Joshua made a choice. Joshua 24, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, he, they had choice through it all. They chose. Again, I've been mentioned in the book of Hosea. I, I just read Hosea again. One of my favorite books, along with others. Uh, in the Old Testament especially, because it shows that. It shows God's mercy and shows them choosing to follow Baal rather than God himself and given the credit to, to Baal rather than God. But yet, even while the people rejected him, look at verse 4, or verse 5 rather, and I have led you 40 years in the wilderness, your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy feet. We can't, I can't even get six months out of a pair of shoes today. Hmm? Yeah. 40 years, the same clothes. We'd have stores would be out of business. Right? They had, their shoes didn't even wear out. I don't know, I have, I have my work shoes on. I don't want to look at the tread of those. But after a few months, the tread is gone. And that's only a couple miles or a few miles a day. God still protected and provided for his people even though they rejected him. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6. We all know this chapter, I think, so. <clears throat> Let's start with verse number 1. It's a small... The beginning of this, I've, I don't know how many messages I've heard about uh, in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You know, the, and his, it's a giant train filling the temple in his vision. Uh, sort of add that to the, the clouds being the dust of his feet. It's talking about the magnificence of God. The, 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 the wonderfulness of God. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. 
and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. To the whole earth is full of his glory. Think of that. We can't put that to today because we're in a sinful world, but there will be a day when the earth will be the glory of God. The new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven. The kingdom established forever. And the post of the door moved at the voice of, of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. You know, the post, imagine the size of those posts that, that Isaiah saw in, in this glorious picture. They were moved, and the house was filled with smoke. That leads me back to, to 1 Kings 11 when, when Solomon finished or, or built the temple that David wasn't, wasn't allowed by God because of his sin to, to build. Uh, and this is a little side note here. Uh, the whole place was filled with the Levites and the singers. And then the glory of the Lord came in. The place was filled with smoke. And the priests couldn't even minister. Because then there was a greater priest that was on the premises now. Uh, and, and people will use that to as... Proof text, Isaiah, uh, not Isaiah, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 8, I believe it is, or 18. They'll use as a proof text for what's known as being slain in the Spirit. See, here it is. The priest couldn't stand the minister. It has nothing to do with being slain in the Spirit. It has all to do with the nation of Israel and having that first temple constructed. Not even for today whatsoever. But I digress and go back to Isaiah chapter 6. Verse number five, then said, said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There is godly humility by Isaiah. He recognized his uncleanness. Had only his nation recognized they were unclean, and, and God desired to make them clean again, they would be. Verse number six. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. We hear of a stone coming out of heaven and crushing the feet of, of the, the, the image of the beast. This stone, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I often look, I often think, and I'm, I'm not often, I'm just thinking about it right now, is that same coal here, can we somehow carry that to Romans 16, heaping burning coals of fire upon one's head with, only, with, with being clean with, uh, by the Lord? Again, I'm thinking on my feet, or as I'm sitting, rather. Uh, and he laid upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. How many times, how many missionaries have you heard use that verse? But here was Isaiah being honest that he was a man of unclean lips. And here was the Lord literally touching him with that coal and forgiving him of all his sins. And he says, I'll go. In verse number nine, and he said, go and tell this people, look what he had to tell them. Hear ye, hear ye indeed, but understand not. God knows, this is God's foreknowledge that his people were gonna reject them. He's gonna tell them to their face. They're not going to understand what they said. Not that, they, not that he had anything that was difficult to understand. 
Isaiah is not really that difficult to book if you have it in its context. The says, and he said, Go and tell the people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and I shall return and shall be, shall be uh, eaten, and a teal tree and an oak tree whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. He says, I know I'm going to keep a remnant of people who will believe, a remnant of Israel that will believe and they'll be back in the land. He says, you're going to keep on proclaiming this I, until I come and destroy them. But yet he leaves, always has a remnant of his people. Let's go to, let's close in, in Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. I said quarter past. I'm going to keep to it today. Romans chapter 11. And of course, if you're in Romans chapter 11, you really need chapters 9 and 10 to go along with that. Because this is a... a, a parenthetical statement what about Israel in in the in 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 this age of grace what about Israel God saying I haven't put them off on the, I haven't put them away blindness in part has happened to them uh, Romans 11 verse number I started to quote it but I want to read it specifically For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So Israel is going to remain in blindness during this time of the Gentiles. We're in that time of the Gentiles now. And there's a lot of... Lot of uh, different theories about when the time of the Gentiles end, but let's keep it simple. When the rapture of the church happens, all this program for Israel will, will pick up once again. God's going to turn his attention, his, his affection, and his judgment upon the nation of Israel. And, and that will commence then. And this is what Isaiah is talking about as well. He, he's, God is going to keep a remnant uh, throughout the years, even we, we, we've always looked at, at, at the birth of Christ, there was a believing remnant then that looked for the consolation of Israel. They looked for the regeneration or the, the times of refreshing to come when Messiah would sit on his throne. And this is what, what will happen then. But uh, what do we do today? We don't have, we don't have to think about what's going to happen on this earth we have our affections in heavenly places we don't have to worry about those things coming upon the world in god's judgment because god has has delivered us from the wrath to come from his judgments to come which will become upon this earth so the next thing on on the table for us can happen any second i actually did it not bad. Any second, with the twinkling of an eye, the rapture of the church could happen. And I always use, like to use the, uh, those, those stupid spring clips that hold things in at CVS. You take the last one, poof, the thing comes forward. That's what's going to happen. After the rapture of the church, 
all these prophecies will, will, will be back in play once again. And, and, and all heaven will break out on earth. All right, one more, one more verse in, in closing. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. This is cool this down right here, low in this this verse here. Verse number nine. The Lord, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all that should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Why? Because they're not looking for it. They've been blinded. That's Isaiah's message. They, they've been blinded. They won't see. They won't perceive the truth. He'll come as a thief in the night. What are they going to be blinded? You know, Bruce Springsteen wrote, blinded by the light, but they're going to be, they're going to be blinded by their own sin, blinded by the God of this world. They won't recognize the, the truth. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with, with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Let's go for a trip to Death Valley. Nothing compared with the judgment of the Lord on this earth. Nevertheless, we, according to his promises, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's what's coming upon this earth. After the rapture of the church happens, we're in heaven. Remember, positionally, where are we today? We're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We have nothing to endure today. Endure a little heat. Might, might hit 100 degrees outside today. I don't know. But that heat's nothing compared to the heat that'll come upon this world when Christ returns and, and puts the whole world into judgment. So we can stay cool. We can stay cool with that, that notion. That what we have here today is nothing compared with the fiery trials to come upon this earth after we're out of here. Amen.